Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege of being gathered here once again. God, as we sing this song, Lord, you open our eyes. Lord, we can't do it ourselves. We're here because we want to see you. We've come tonight because we want to hear your voice, Lord. God, we've done all that we know to do in preparation to make our way here, to prepare our hearts, to repent, to lay before you, Lord, and ask that now you would come and do the part we can't do ourselves. May you give us the eyes to have to see and the ears to hear. God, may you reveal yourself to us in a greater way than ever before. May we see you, Lord, unveiled before us as you continue to unfold that revelation. Lord, I pray that you would take preeminence and speak your word through these lips, that you would have absolute and utter control, Lord. May we be yielded completely to you, God, and may you do what you've intended to do this night. May we go from here strengthened, Lord, and may we go from here illuminated and and we go back out into the world as bright and shining lights to shine forth the glory of this gospel. We ask that you'd bless all we say and do for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're standing, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I heard it was announced to remind everybody of the um, celebration of life ceremony for Brother John Matthew, so everybody's invited and welcome to come at 10.30 on Saturday. And it's gonna be a busy weekend. We also have the youth camp out this weekend, so the youth will be doing that, but the Kyle will be ministering there. So be in prayer for them and for everybody who's involved with the celebration of life as well, and pray for the family. Amen. Let's read here 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. If any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Praise God. Let's be seated. You may be seated. This, I wanted to start with the scripture because it means a lot to me. I want to go into uh, part two of what we were talking about on Sunday. And so there'll be just a little bit, maybe a little bit of review, uh, but some things that I just have in my heart to go into. And like I said, don't wait for something new because this is just review of things we've been talking about for the last several years. But I realize that these are things that I want to see better, amen? That I don't believe that I've come to the end of the unveiling of God and that there's no more to see, but I want to see more, amen? And, and this scripture means a lot to me because if you think, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. I think it's a good thing for us to remember that whatever we know, we don't know it like we ought to know it, amen? There's always more to know. So when we go back over things and we review them again, it's constantly unfolding itself, and and so we want to see it more clearly. So Brother Branham said, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. He said, look, what was once God's great secret, great mysterious secret in his mind, is now put in the hearts of the believer, that is the body of Christ. What was God's once great secret in his mind before the foundation of the world is now made manifest. Think of it, see, oh my, I'm sure we don't, we don't get it. Well, I can't see it the way I ought to, and I'm sure you don't. That's the truth. How many can say amen? Now, Brother Benham is in Christ is the mystery of God revealed, and he's revealing the great mystery of God, and Christ is the mystery of God revealed. And, and he's, he's revealing, he's speaking of that great mystery that lays under the seven seals. And he comes to it, and, and he says, now what was the great mysterious secret that was in his mind is now put in the hearts of the believers. That is the body of Christ. So Brother Venom's saying what was once the great mysterious secret in God's mind has now been put into the heart of the believers in the body of Christ. And then he comes and says, well, I know you don't see it. Frankly, I don't. Well, he said, I don't see it like I ought to, and I'm sure you don't see it. He, see, he says it's already been transferred into the believers, but you don't see it like you ought to. And so you can receive this great mystery, but it doesn't mean we see it like we ought to. I think there's more that we can see. Amen. So the one thing I want to come to a realization on as we keep looking at these things and and ministering these things as the Lord leads us is that we don't ever want to assume that we've come to the end of the understanding of all the things that God has unveiled for us. Amen. They've all been given, but I don't think we've come to the end of the unveiling of all things that's been given. And I think he's continually unveiling himself. Amen. So there's so much more to see. 
again, in God hiding himself in simplicity, then revealing himself in the same, he said, then, and watch what he done. He preached such a mighty Christ coming. He's speaking of John the Baptist. He's got his fan in his hand and his fanning his way. I mean, he will thoroughly purge his floors. He will take up the trash and sweep it out yonder and burn it. That's right, he will gather up the grain and take it into the garner. See, he was inspired. But when Jesus come, they was looking for, and all the apostles, you know, they, they was looking for a great something to come. My, my, boy, he's coming. That's all there is to it. Boy, he will be mighty. He will kick them Romans off the face of the earth. He will make them Greeks go this way and Romans go, th th uh, go that when he come. When he come, a little humble fellow being pushed around from one side to the other. What was it? God hiding himself in simplicity. So we, we talked about this last time, but I want to keep speaking on that. When John the Baptist, amen, when he came, we, we talked about the prophecies before that was laying in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3 and, and in Malachi 4 of his coming. And when he come to fulfill that, the fulfillment didn't match the intellectual understanding or the, or the intellectual interpretation of what you could physically read in the prophecy. Because by physical reading, you would come up with the wrong picture. But when God, amen, manifested, amen, only those with the seed on the inside could receive it, amen? Because it wasn't by intellectual putting the pieces together, it was by the Holy Ghost revealing the truth, amen? So now he's here speaking, he's a forerunner, and he's speaking of the thing that he's forerunning, and the thing that he's forerunning, amen, is the coming of the Lord, and as he's speaking of it, he's describing him as, well, there's one coming after me, I'm not that one, but there's one coming after me, whose shoe latches, I'm not worthy to unloose, and his fan is in his hand, and he'll thoroughly purge the, the threshing floor. Amen, and he'll burn the chaff and he'll gather the wheat into the garners. So you can imagine standing that, that, that day, standing there all around John, hearing him on the banks of Jordan preach this, they would get an image in their mind of what this coming Christ would be like. They would imagine, amen, a man who, who, who John, and as great as John is, as powerful of a preacher as he is, amen, he's not worthy to unloose, unlatch uh, uh, the buckle of his shoes. And he says he's got his, he, his fan in his hand, he'll thoroughly purge the threshing floor and burn the chaff and gather the wheat into the garner. And I can imagine their hearts would burn at this description of such a mighty, such a mighty one coming, amen, such a victorious one. But when Jesus come and entered his ministry, it was nothing like what they imagined. The imagination of what John said and the interpretation and when it come to manifestation, they couldn't match intellectually. That's why the disciples that would follow Jesus, they couldn't even really put two and two together and get four because they didn't even understand what was going on or what he was saying. Amen, it was later, I mean, after the baptism of the Holy Ghost, when they were able to start putting the scriptures together to what they had seen and what they had heard. But at that time, they didn't even understand some of the things that Jesus was saying. They couldn't even comprehend when he would begin to say, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no part with me. And Brother Mary said they had no idea what he meant by that. But you know what the carnal understanding of that is? Eating flesh and drinking blood. But we know it was spiritually manifest, amen? It came into a spiritual fulfillment of that prophecy. And so they wouldn't understand it till later, but because the, just because they didn't understand it didn't mean that they didn't recognize this was the Christ. Because he looked at his disciples when so many went away, he said, will you go also? And Peter says, where shall we go? Thou alone has the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art Christ, the son of the living God. He had that much revelation given from the Father and he couldn't move off that revelation even though the other things that he was hearing he was not able to explain. He wasn't able to place them, didn't understand how it would happen. And when, you know, can you imagine the disciples having to face their family? Who were there that day when Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh or drink my blood, you have no part of it. Can you imagine trying to answer that question? Amen. And when they, when they come to them and says, what does he mean by, what does he mean by eat flesh and drink his blood? You heard, you heard the same thing I heard, Peter. Andrew, you heard what I heard. That man said that we got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now, what does that mean? Can you imagine, Peter? He has no answer. Amen. 
He cannot tell him what it means, amen? He would find out later, later by revelation, he would be able to tell him what the fulfillment of that was. But in that day, he couldn't tell him what that was. And I can imagine maybe he would stutter a little bit and get red in the face and say, I don't know. And say, how can you follow a man like that that says things like that? He says, I don't know. I mean, don't, what do you think he meant? I don't know. Are you really gonna eat his flesh and drink his blood? I don't know. But I know one thing, that that's the Christ, the Son of the living God. I know one thing, that he alone has the words of eternal life. I can't answer your question. I can't explain it. I can't put the pieces together. It's beyond my comprehension right now. But I know that that man has the words of eternal life. So we see in God hiding himself in simplicity that even John, when John would come and speak of Jesus, in, in an intellectual mind would form a picture of what this great one must be like. And when we sung this song, you know, uh, open our eyes, I want to see Jesus, amen, the question is what are you looking for? What do you expect to see, amen? What, when you say I want to see Jesus, when you talk to that to, in a denominational setting, people are looking to see a physical form and nail prints and a beard and, and long hair and a robe, amen, but, but I hope that we've gone beyond that when we sing I want to see Jesus, that we're not looking for the physical image or the nail scarred hands, but we're looking for the word made manifest. So when we sing the song, what do we mean by the song? What are we looking for? Because if we don't know what we're looking for, amen, we don't know what we see. I was meditating today and I just was thinking, I was praying, and I said, God, help us to see what we're looking at. Help us to see what we're looking at. We're looking at it, but help us to see it, amen? And, and you know, how is it that you can pray a prayer like that? Because it's happened to me time and time and time again in the message. I'll look at something and look at something and look at something and read it and read it and read it. Then all of a sudden I see it. So I can continue to pray, God help us to see what we're looking at. Because you've given it to us for, for us to look at it, to read it, amen, to ponder over it. But it takes God, amen, to bring a revelation, a, a divine revelation from the Father to help us to see what we're looking at. They were looking at Jesus, but they didn't see him. They were looking at the Christ. They were looking at the Word made flesh. They were looking at the manifestation for their day, but they didn't see it. They were hearing the words that came from his voice, but they didn't hear him. So you can have hearing and not hear, and you can see and not see, but, but I say, God, let us see what we're looking at. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to read here about John. John is the one who was the forerunning of the Messiah. He is the one who saw the dove descend upon the lamb. He is the one who saw the sign and declared that this is the lamb of God. He's the one the next day who pointed out and said, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And two of his disciples left and began to follow Jesus. This is the same one that said, behold, his fan is in his hand. He does thoroughly purge the threshing floor. He's the one who said, there's one among you. This is the same one. And we get in here to Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in, in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and he said unto him, Art thou he that shall come, or do we look for another? Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? This was John who announced his coming. It was John who announced his arrival. It was John who declared that this was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was John who said, there's one among you. It was John who saw the sign. This is the same individual, and now he's in prison, and he's sent two disciples to ask a question. Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? 
Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. This is the key. John, John now had a question, and he sends two disciples to ask the question, are you the one that should come, or do we look for another? And, and Jesus could have got all kinds of upset and said, you're the one who saw the sign, amen? You were there when the Holy Ghost descended like a dove. You heard the voice, amen? What do you mean, am I the one or do I look for another? And you realize that even John's prophecy, what he said was coming and what he saw didn't even match in his own intellectual understanding. Even John, amen, the forerunner had a certain expectation and his expectation uh, uh, when he would begin to say what he was saying, he had an expectation and even Jesus may not have met John's expectation. I hope you don't think I'm st stretching too far when saying that because those are the things the prophet of God told us. He said his eagle eye began to film over in prison and he began to question and began to wonder. But Jesus took him back to the fulfillment of the word, amen. And he says, he didn't say, no, I'm him. He said, go tell John I'm the one and go remind him of, uh, of what, go remind him of what he saw and what he said. No, he says, go tell him, amen. All of the prophecies are being fulfilled. Everything that it said I would do, I'm doing. So go back and give him the word, amen. Go back and tell him, show him the manifestation of the word or the fulfillment of the word. And then say this, blessed is he who is not ashamed in me. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended, I'm sorry, offended in me. And, and what the brother Brennan was telling us, amen, what he's telling us in a message, the, uh, what did he say? The forgotten beatitude, I believe, that's what it was. Because blessed is, so all the Beatitudes are blessed is the meek and blessed is this. But here we come later after the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And Brother Branham called this the lost Beatitude. And that is don't be offended in the way he comes, amen? Don't be offended in the manifestation of the word. There's a prophecy and a manifestation. Just because the manifestation doesn't match your intellectual understanding of the prophecy, don't be offended in him. Don't be offended in him just because it doesn't match, just because you can't make it match. Don't be offended in him. But what did he show John? The fulfillment of the word, the manifestation of the prophecies. Go tell him that and tell him not to be offended in me. Malachi 4. Let's turn back just a little bit to Malachi chapter 4. Now, I told you we're going to continue on with Sunday, but I don't remember giving you the title again. It was The Unexpected Fulfillment. The Unexpected Fulfillment. That's what John was dealing with. The fulfillment was not what he expected. His expectation didn't match the fulfillment. So God had to bring him back to the Word. Christ had to bring him back to, what, what, are you one? Are you come for, are you another? And you know, Jesus didn't answer his question. I just, I love this. Jesus rarely answers a question. Usually he asks another question. And so what he's trying to do is, you know, uh, we got to get beyond the notion that Jesus came for everyone. He came for his father's sheep. He came for his sheep, the lost sheep. That's who he came for. And in coming for them, he redeemed everything. And in redeeming back everything, now there will, be, there will be rewards given to more than just the sheep. That's his mercy. But, but he, was, he comes and he doesn't say, hey, I'm him, I'm the one, I'm this and I'm that, and let me tie it all together for you. No, he just demonstrated the word. He just manifest the word, and he let the Spirit of God, amen, call out the sheep. He was there to find the sheep, but how did he find the sheep? By manifesting the word. And the manifestation of the word for their day is what caught the seed for that day. And so when John comes and asks a question, he doesn't slip him a note and say, John, you remember this and you remember that, amen, remember, I, I, I mean, no, 
He, he said, go tell John, amen, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the gospels preached to the poor. Go tell him this is the manifestation of the promise. Because that's, that's what opens the eyes of the sheep, of God's children, the, manifest, the manifested word. So when we come here to Malachi 4, let's just read it, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. As we said Sunday, uh, people have been reading their Bibles now for hundreds and hundreds of years. And in these hundreds of years of reading the Bible, they've, had, they've come across this verse and there's all kinds of interpretations of how this will be fulfilled. But God interprets his word by bringing it to pass. And when God has brought this to pass in our day, he brings it to pass in a fulfillment of the word. And that fulfillment of the word is to attract the elect. And the elect will be attracted to the fulfillment of the word. And so, and they will not be offended in the way he fulfills his word. Because we're not offended that he used a Kentuckian with a seventh grade education and poor grammar. That doesn't offend me. Does it offend you? I'm not offended, amen, that he called him out of Kentucky and he ministered in Jeffersonville. I'm not offended that, that by the end of his ministry, most everybody had pulled away from him and, and thought that he was off and got off at the end and, and that he started off good, but he wasn't doing good anymore. At the end. I'm not offended in that because that's the way God chose to manifest his word. And something in me says, that's nothing but the truth. That was the fulfillment of Malachi 4. See, he does it in such a way it can only attract the elect. In the message, the trial, we read this Sunday, but I'd like to go through it again. In the trial from 1964, he says, and he spoke down on the river, he said, as John the Baptist was sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ. I love this sentence. I'm going to read it twice. As John the Baptist, so he's saying as John the Baptist, he's saying as then, it'll be now. As we did then, it's going to happen in you. As John the Baptist was sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ, at the end of his ministry, Jesus came. When did Jesus come? At the end of the forerunner's ministry. At the end of his ministry, Jesus came. Brother Branham said as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ. At the end of his ministry, Jesus came. And as John was sent, so will your ministry forerun the second coming of Christ. Parallel tracks. He's saying, as it was here, it'll be here. Let's not be offended in the way he fulfilled that. In the message, God hiding himself in simplicity, then revealing himself in the same. Now, I want to I wanna go through that title again and again and again until it locks in, because I've heard this title, I've read this title, we've discussed this title, but it's taking on more meaning to me all the time. Since God is hiding himself in simplicity, we got that. God's always hiding himself in simplicity. John was a simple preacher, amen? He wasn't a priest, he wasn't this. Brother Branham was a simple preacher, amen? Peter was simple, Andrew was simple, John was simple. They were all simple. Your average Joe, some of them may have been considered below average Joe. But it was simple, amen? God was hiding himself in simplicity, amen? And when he was hiding himself in simplicity, but it says, and revealing himself in the same. So we're comfortable with God hiding himself in in simplicity, but we've got to get comfortable with him revealing himself in the same. Because if you're gonna see the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's gonna come out of the same kind of simplicity that he's hiding himself in. So if he's hiding himself in simplicity, he's really revealing himself in the same. So why are we comfortable with him hiding himself in uh, uh, simplicity, but we're still looking for something big for the revelation? If it's hidden in simplicity, it's going to be revealed in simplicity. When he hides it in something small, obscure, out of the way, unnoticed, he's going to be revealing it through the same thing. So he's not going to hide it in something simple and reveal it in something great. He's going to hide it in something simple and reveal it in something simple. That's why Brother Branham had to preach this at the beginning of the seals. 
It was ordained of God. The title was ordained. The order of the service was ordained. What he said was ordained. And he comes to the beginning of this week of services where he's going to be preaching the seven seals. And he starts with God hiding himself in simplicity and revealing himself the same so that we don't miss that God always hides himself in a simple vessel. And we all say amen. We can read our Bibles. Amen. They were all simple vessels. But don't miss that he's revealing himself in the same simple vessels. Unless you want him to stay hidden. But he didn't hide himself to stay hidden. He hid himself so he could be revealed. But he wants to be hidden from some and revealed to others. So how is he going to be revealed to some and hidden from others? Well, he'll, reveal, he'll, reveal, he'll hide himself in simplicity so that the great and the intellectual and everybody else will miss it, and he'll reveal himself in simplicity so the simple will catch it. Remember, he was going to hide himself as a baby, but he was going to hide himself in a stable. And first he hid himself in a virgin from an out-of-way city that, 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 that there's nothing good spoke of in the Bible. He's gonna hide in this little virgin that is a nobody. And what's hidden in her? Christ himself. The word himself is hidden in her. And God is coming down uh, uh, in the fulfillment of the word. He's coming down riding on a donkey. Amen. Why? Because the whole world had to be taxed. Amen. So the whole world taxation was to fulfill the word of God to bring this simple, humble virgin. Amen. Down on the back of a donkey, led all the way down to Bethlehem because the prophecy has to be fulfilled. And she's not great enough to make the prophecy fulfilled. So the great God is hiding it in a worldwide taxation. Worldwide politics is doing what? Hiding the simplicity. Amen. So now he's, com he's coming, coming in simplicity, amen, and then coming down and being born, amen, not, not in any significant place, but being born in a stable, amen, and being placed in a manger. Amen. So born in a stable, placed in a manger, what was it? God hiding himself in simplicity. Amen, but when it came time to reveal himself, he had to get a group of people that would understand this hiding place, so he went to a group of shepherds out in the field. Brother Bam said, illiterate shepherds. And he went to those illiterate shepherds and revealed what was going on in that stable, and they were simple enough to receive it, amen? They didn't question it. They didn't have to go talk to the high priest. Amen. They saw angels. Amen. The angel declared to them what was happening. They heard the angels singing. They ran, amen, into the city to go see, amen, what was taking place in simplicity. And hiding in simplicity, amen, was Emmanuel. And Emmanuel was there in that form of a baby laying in a manger in a stable. Amen. And those shepherds come in there and they begin to worship him. They didn't care he was a baby. They didn't care he was in a stable. They didn't care what his swatting claws were made of. They didn't care he was laying in a manger. Amen. They could receive what God was hiding in simplicity because he was revealing it in the same form. And because they could receive it, they were not offended in this manifestation. So they ran into Bethlehem and told everybody what they had seen and what the angels told them because they were not offended in him. Praise be to God. Do you think anything's different today? Nothing is different today. They were not offended in that manifestation. They were not offended in that fulfillment of the word. Why? Because they're simple. Amen. The, the, the simple could hear. The simple could receive. Amen. Because they, they were ordained, predestinated to receive. How many people passed by? How many people the next day would go into that stable to go get their animal? Lead them out, feed them, do whatever. And they would see that there was a baby born overnight and see this woman and just grab their cow, grab their donkey, grab whatever and walk out and pay no attention to what was going on. But there was, there was shepherds running around town 
saying, we saw an angel. Angel told us this. We went and found it just like the angel said. This is Emmanuel. This is Messiah. Amen. This, this is the prophecy being fulfilled. And they looked at the illiterate simple shepherd. Well, what was the simple shepherd? Now the mystery was hidden in the shepherd and revealed in the same. They were revealing the fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. And they, the people wouldn't receive it because of who had the message. And the story repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. All the way down to this day and all the way into this building and all the way into your pew. I guess we don't have pews, but seats. I didn't want to leave anybody out. But he's hidden in simplicity and revealed in the same. Don't look for the hiding and simplicity and the revealing of something great. You'll miss it. In this message, he says, you love him? My, isn't he wonderful? I hope and trust that the message will produce what it was intended to do. That it'll get you to the place that you don't look for flowery things. When you see God in greatness, look how humble it is, and then you'll see God. Don't look for him. When Elisha was back in that cave, the smoke went across Blood, thunder, lightning, and all these kinds of sensations. We've had blood in the face and in the hands and sensations and everything. They've never bothered that prophet. He just laid there. But he heard a still small voice. What was it? The word. Lock into that. What was that still small voice? It was the word. Then he covered his face and walked out. See, that was it. Remember, friend, don't look for big. You say, God, he speaks of great big things. There'll come a time there'll be this, that, or the other great big things. I hope you're catching what I'm talking about, great big things. And oh, when this comes to pass, it'll be great, big like this, and it'll be so humble you'll miss the whole thing and just go right on, see? You'll look back and say, well, that never did come. You see, you pass right over the top and you never even seen it. See, it's so simple, and God lives in simplicity to manifest himself in greatness. What makes him great? Because he can simplify himself. Now, I want to go to 1 Kings and look at this. We've looked at it before, but let's go to 1 Kings 19 and look at Elijah in the cave again. And the reason I want to look at it is after I preached it on Sunday, I ran into Brother Emmanuel, and Brother Emmanuel shared with me a quote that he had just heard. And when I said, brother, that's good, it had to do with this, and, he, and I said, send it to me. So last night, he sent it to me in, in, late in the night, and I read it, and I got so excited. He found several quotes on this, and, and I just want to bring it to you because it's fresh for me, uh, and we thank God for using a simple vessel of Brother Emmanuel. Amen. First Kings 19.9. And he came hither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great... And strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. Behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here? Elijah. So we know this, and Brother Branham is referring to this and God hiding himself in simplicity. And he says there was the great big loud uh, uh, wind that was breaking the rocks and shattering them. And there was the, the fire that burnt through the mountain. There was the, the earthquake that shook it all. Amen. But none of that moved Elijah. So 
He was showing that it was going to be in simplicity, not something great, not something big. Brother Brennan mentions this in God hiding himself in simplicity. He said, but when he heard the still small voice, what was it? The word. When he heard the word, the word moved him like the thunder or the, the, the wind couldn't move him. The earthquake couldn't move him. The fire couldn't move him. But the still small voice of the word is what moved him in humility to wrap a mantle around his face and go out to meet God. And here's the, one of the quotes that Brother Emmanuel sent to me. He says, in the 1960, in The Unchangeable God, he says, when he pulled back in the cave, there came an earthquake outside that shook the cave where he was sitting. There came a mighty rushing wind. There came thunders and lightnings and blowing, and it was all God, but it didn't attract the prophet. It didn't touch him somehow. He knowed what God's power was. He knowed God had shook the mountains and he had rushing winds and so forth and sent fire out of the heaven, but he waited. And way down inside of him came a little still voice. Where did the voice come from? Way down inside of him come a little still voice that attracted the prophet. There was something, he'd seen his power to do things, but this time he felt his presence and a still small voice speaking into his heart. Then the prophet raised up and went out to the end of the cave. What moved him? The word, amen. What word? The still small voice that was down inside of him that was speaking to his heart. Amen, this is important because of what we wanna, what we wanna look at. I wanna look at this next quote and we'll talk about that. Uh, in 1962, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, says the thing of it is, like I was saying last night, the Pentecostals are waiting for a rushing mighty wind, but they failed to hear that still small voice. It's wrong to do those things, they think, as long as, what's wrong to do those things? Uh, as long as the wind is rushing, all right. I think as long as the wind is rushing, as long as there's enthusiasm, as long as there's excitement, as long as we can see something or hear something, that's it. And here's what Brother Brown said, but that didn't attract the prophet's attention. The rushing wind never bothered the prophet Elijah in the cave. The mighty thunders and lightnings and pouring down never attracted him. But what startled him was that still small voice, that something speaking with inside. My word is truth. Let every man's word be a lie and mine be truth. That's what attracted the prophecy and, it's still, it's, it'll, and it'll still do it. The word of God always attracts the spiritual mind because it's the mind of Christ in you that knows that that word is true. That's what Peter had, amen? Peter had something that could receive a revelation from the Father that would say, I don't understand what you're talking about. I don't know what you mean, amen, by what if the Son of Man goes up where he come down from uh, unless I eat your flesh. I don't understand, but this I know, that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou alone have the words of eternal life. Amen, there was something that Peter had heard, and what Peter heard moved him. And, and here in 1 Kings, when when Brother Bram is describing this in the cave, he's in the cave, and, and I just wanted to, to look at it this way. He's in separation. He's all by himself. Elijah is away from everybody. He's all alone. And he's in a cave. And if you'll just allow me this flexibility, let's just say he's in a little room. Let's just say he's in a little room all by himself. And there's a lot of noise going on all around the room in the little cave, all by himself with nobody else present. And all by himself with nobody else present, all the noise is going on all around him. The wind breaking the rocks in pieces Amen, the roar of the fire as it rushes through, the earthquake as it shakes everything, and nothing moves him into action. Nothing brings him out of the cave. Nothing brings him out humbled, amen. But when he hears the still small voice with inside him, then he comes to the end of the little room, amen, with a mantle wrapped around his face ready to meet God. Amen, you know, there, there's, there's, there's so much noise 
All around there's noise, friends. There's noise from everybody. I mean, everything is noisy. Uh, there's religion is noisy, politics is noisy, entertainment is noisy, the world, everything around is noisy, noise here and noise there. And I'll tell you another thing, everybody has an opinion. Do you agree? I mean, the ones closest to you, even your own family, they got an opinion. But sometimes you don't value or appreciate Everybody, there's noise, 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 noise. But God, amen, had to get Elijah's attention and all the noise wasn't going to do it. But when he was all alone, back in a little cave, all alone with nobody else present, there was a different kind of noise that resounded and the noise that he heard was a still small voice, amen. And that still small voice he heard with inside of him. And when he heard that voice, now it was time to wrap his face in a mantle. The earthquake didn't cause him to wrap his face. The fire, the wind, it didn't cause, but wrapping his face in a mantle is a sign of ultimate humility. And when he heard this still small voice, he wrapped his, his face in his mantle and he went to the end of the cave, amen, to, to meet God, amen, to, to meet God face to face. But he didn't do it with pride or arrogancy or any of those great big things. It was the little still small voice that moved him to humble himself and get him back in action because he was hiding away. And he come out of that cave with a commission to fulfill. He come out of that cave with a work to do. He come out of that cave with a purpose to do for God. And God took him and put him right back in action. And, and there's noise. Lots and lots of noise. But we need to draw to the little cave. And you'll hear somebody say this and somebody will say that. Listen. Don't let that move you. There's a fire over here and there's a thunder over there and there's a wind over here. Don't let that move you. Because if you let that move you, you'll be chasing the wind from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, trying to catch that wind. If you let the earthquake move you, I mean, you're going to be waiting for the next earthquake to move you, amen? But it wasn't any of that that the prophet was waiting for. It wasn't any of that that God, amen, used to get him out of the cave. What God used, amen, was the still small voice with inside of him. Sometimes what we need to do is get away from all the noise. And I don't mean move somewhere. I mean, that sounds nice. Let's go to Montana or North Dakota. I think North Dakota has more pigs than they have humans. Sounds good to me. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, amen, drawing aside, amen, getting alone with God, amen. You can do that in a crowded room. You can do that in a church full of people. But get alone with God and say, God, I'm listening for your voice in me, amen. I'm listening for the revelation that can only come from the Father that you tell me this is the word, this is the way, this is the truth. Can't keep chasing the noise. We got to go alone before God and hear his voice with inside. See, you can't accomplish this with tape listening only. We can listen to tapes. We can't accomplish this with preaching only. All those are tools that God will use to speak to us but the still small voice is the one with inside, down in the heart. That's the one that moves us. That's the revelation that comes from the Father. That's the one, that's the divine revealer of the word. Telling you, this is the truth, amen? This is right, this is the way. This is my way. So, so many voices, so much noise but there's a still small voice. I wonder how many times we've come to the message we wanna serve the Lord and we get alone with God and we run out every time something shakes. I wonder how many times, 
every time something shakes, we, we, we pop our head out to see what that is, or we run to it. Or every time there, there's something happening, we run to the shaking, we run to the moving, we run to the fire. Amen. But we moved too early. Because we moved before we had our own revelation. We chased the fire. We chased the, the wind. We've chased the earthquake. But the problem with that is you just keep chasing, chasing, chasing. I wonder if we could just wait a little bit longer. Just get along with God and just wait a little bit longer until God drops something into our hearts that says, this is it. This is true. And it'll bring us to a humility where we realize it wasn't me. It wasn't anything I've done. It wasn't anything I could think up or conjure up or accomplish or understand. But I wrap myself in my mantle and I come to the entrance to meet the Lord because it's all him. Now I just want him to tell me what I'm supposed to do and I want to go and I want to do what he tells me to do. I want to be what he's called me to be. I want to obey all he's told me to obey. That's the effect of the still small voice. Brother Branham is preaching in the seventh seal, and I just want to go into the seventh seal for a little bit. I don't intend to be long. I just want to read some things that are familiar, but I want to read it in this context. He said, and I had my hands out, and all at once something hit my hand. I don't know. He's talking about a, the incident in Sabino Canyon with the sword in his hand, and, and he, he's come to the seventh seal. And in preaching the seventh seal, we went through this before, he doesn't preach the seventh seal the way he preaches the first six seals. So I want to keep reiterating that. I want, I, want to, I want to keep talking about that. I want God to keep unveiling it to us, amen? Because in the first six seals, he gave us the interpretation, amen, of what the symbol meant. The symbol means this, and what you saw there represents this, and this is that, and this is that. And he goes through the scriptures and tying it all together. But when it comes to the seventh seal, he doesn't have that luxury. Because when you go to the seventh seal in Revelation chapter 8, there's nothing there to go off of. It's just there's silence. And so he can't preach it the same way he preached to others because this seal is different in the Bible. And because this seal is different in the Bible, he can't preach it the same way he preached the other six. So he's coming now and he's preaching it, and, and then he comes to this point here. He's just went back over, I mean, the sixth seal, and he's went back over the gap between the sixth and the seventh, and he showed chapter seven, the 144,000, and then all, all the saints of tribulation, and now he's went through that, and now he's coming to the, to the seventh seal, and when he's coming here, he just says, I feel to stop. When he feels to stop, then he starts talking about visions, and he starts talking about experiences. Now remember, he's not preaching the seventh seal the same way he preached the sixth. He says, I had my hands out and all at once something hit my hand. I don't know, I can't say. Did I go to sleep? I don't know. Did I go into a trance? I don't know. Was it a vision? I can't tell you. Only thing I can say is it's just the same thing that them angels was. And it struck my hand and I looked and it was a sword and it had pearl handles, real pretty, had a guard over it with gold and the blade looked like something like chrome, like silver, only it was real shiny. And it was so feather edged sharp, oh my. And I thought, isn't that the prettiest thing? It just fit my hand. I thought, that's awful pretty. But said, hey, I'm always afraid of them things, a sword. And I thought, what will I do with that? And just then a voice shook down through there that rocked the rocks. It's the sword of the king. And then I come out of it, the sword of the king. Now if it said a sword of a king, but it said the sword of the king, and there's only one, the king, and that's God. And he has one sword, and that's his word that I live by. That so helped me God standing over his holy desk with his holy word laying here. It's the word, amen? So what is that sword that's put in his hand? It's the word. And Brother Brandon's getting so excited. What's he at? He's at the preaching of the seventh seal. And he's not preaching the seventh seal the way he preached the sixth. So quit expecting him to preach the seventh the way he preaches the sixth. Don't read the seventh like you read the sixth. Read the seventh differently. 
And when he's reading, the, now when he comes to the seventh, he says, now, I was in Sabino Canyon. I said, Lord, what is this? Something hit my hand. I looked at it. The rocks thundered out. It thundered out that shook the rocks. It's the king of the sword. And he says, there's only one, the king, and he only has one sword, and that's the word. He said, oh, praise God. He gets excited with his holy word laying here. It's the word. Amen. It's the word. So what is this? It's the word. And now he, he goes on. He says, and what a day we're living in. What a great thing. See the, mystery, see the mystery and the secret. We're showing you the mystery and the secret. What's the mystery and the secret? It's whatever was in his hand. It's the word. Standing there, when this left me, something just come to me and said, don't fear. Now I didn't hear no voice. Like on the inside of me spoke. I didn't hear no voice, like on the inside of me spoke. I had to just tell you the truth, just exactly what happened. Something hit and said, don't fear, this is that third pool. That wasn't an audible voice, amen. That was, hey listen, I just want to say it this way. Let's back up to, to 1 Kings when Elijah was in the, uh, uh, in the cave all alone, all by himself. He was in the little room all alone and, and there was fire and earthquake and, and there was all these, if anybody had been in the vicinity around there, they would have heard the earthquake shake. They would have heard the thunder, amen, or the wind uh, bust those rocks. They would have heard the fire come roaring through, amen. But there was something that was spoken in silence. Silence. There was something spoken in silence, and only the one it was intended for could hear it, and he heard a still, small voice. What was it? The word. Where did he hear it? Down inside of him. Listen, this is why, this is the very reason why Brother Branham cannot tell you what the seventh seal is. This is the reason. He can't come and say, listen, here's a flow chart and here's a graph. He was told, amen, this will be, the, he was told something down inside of me, not an audible voice, but something like down on the inside of me said, don't fear, this is the third pool. And when he goes, this is the third pool, he goes right back to the vision he had seven years ago and the vision of where he was trying to fish and catch those rainbow trout out in the deep water. And the rainbow trout are the covenant fish, the children of God. They were in the deep water and he was trying to catch them. And there was all kinds of preachers out there fishing. Catch the vision. Everybody's trying to catch fish, but Brother Branham is trying to catch the rainbow trout in the deep water. And he knows how to fish, and he's got a technique, and the ministers gather all around, and he starts explaining his technique, and that's where he got in trouble, because he explained the first pull, sign in the hand, and the second pull, discernment, and he spent too much time explaining them, and on the second pull, he pulled it too hard and caught a little bitty fish that was just like skin over the lure, just like them other ones was catching so he's catching the same fish Jack Coe was catching and A.A. Allen was catching, Oral Roberts was catching. But it wasn't the kind of fish he was going after. And, he was, and, and, and so there was supposed to be a third pull in the technique. First pull to attract attention to the little fish. Second pull to scare the little fish away, amen. And the third pull would get the big fish because when the little fish scattered, it would get the attention of the big fish. They would come closer and on the third pull, they would get hooked. That was the technique, but he messed it up on the second pull. And he got his line all tangled. He said, I pulled too hard. And he said, I heard a voice say, don't get your line tangled. And at first, I told you not to do that. And he said, oh God, I'm a stupid person, forgive me. He said, don't get your line tangled at a time like this. And he had a line in his hand, and then he looked, and it was a baby shoe. We went through all of this with the big cord. He's trying to lace it, and he told him, you can't teach uh, Pentecostal babies supernatural things. Leave them alone. So quit trying to teach them. That's what he was always trying to do. Explain it, explain it, explain it. But the whole point of the vision is to get him not to explain it. Then he comes 
Amen. And then he's brought up on high and he sees a big tent like a cathedral. Amen. And, and inside he, he sees people coming around and inside on the platform is a little room and people are going into the little room. Amen. And they're going in afflicted and they're coming out whole. And there's a reporter trying to ask them, amen, what happened? And they said, I don't know. They can't explain what happened. But they went in one by one by themselves in the little room. And they were afflicted and now they're whole. I hope you're not looking for a little room somewhere under a cathedral so you can walk into it. I hope you're not looking for Brother Brandon to come back and set up a tent somewhere and build a little wooden box in there. But I hope you're understanding that all of those people were afflicted. What caused affliction? The fall. What caused the fall? Unbelief. What's being fixed in this little box? It's more than legs, it's more than crutches, it's more than a wheelchair, it's more than that. Amen, I don't care if I limp the rest of my life, I don't wanna limp spiritually anymore. Amen, I want the unbelief washed away, I want the revelation of the word to change the effects of unbelief in my life. That's what caused all the affliction. They come into this little room, amen, and what did the angel of the Lord say? I'll meet you in there, amen, and he saw that pillar of fire go down there. And so what was in there, amen, it was the pillar of fire. What is the pillar of fire? The Lord himself. What is the new birth, Brother Branham? Amen, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ personally to you. There was something going on as they would get in contact with Christ one by one as an individual. And guess what it was? It was silent. Nobody else knew. Somebody on the outside has a tablet trying to write down what went on inside. Amen. And the person coming out can't explain what went on inside. But where I was afflicted, now I'm whole. This is a spiritual fulfillment. And he says, he was told, he said, that will be your third pool. That will be your third pool, and you won't tell it to nobody. Then on Sabino Canyon, when the voice speaks within him, he said, don't fear, this is your third pool. Sabino Canyon was a sword in the hand, not a tent in a box. Do you understand? He's saying this is the same thing. So the sword in the hand and the tent and the little box and the Lord in there, it's the same thing. That'll be your third pole. This is your third pole. But it doesn't look the same. One looks like a tent with people walking and afflicted coming out home. The other one's just a sword in your hand. How can that be your third pole? And how can this be the third pole? So when you go into the box, you'll have a sword for the third pole? He said the sword is the word, amen? It's the word. What is this? This is the third pull. This is the very thing that will attract and catch the rainbow trout and bring them into the kingdom of God. This is the very thing. What is it? It's the word. What was the tent and the box and the shikai? It's the same thing. It's the third pull. It's the word to the individual. One person, one at a time. To everybody else, it's silent. Nobody else can hear what God revealed to you. All they can do is see the effect. Coming out of the box, they could see the effect, but nobody knew what happened in the box. In the little room, something happened. I can't explain to you what happened, but something happened. So nobody knows what's in secret. Nobody heard what took place, but they could see the effect. And now nobody, nobody knows what you heard. Nobody's heard what you heard. Nobody knows what you know. What do you mean? Nobody knows what I know. Listen, nobody knows what God revealed to you about you and about this message. I mean, you can act like you've had an experience with God, you can pretend, you, but no, nobody heard it, nobody was there, no, it was in silence. He said, now back to the seventh seal, he said, 
Now, I didn't hear no voice like the inside of me spoke. I have to just tell you the truth, just exactly what happened. Something hit and said, don't fear, this is that third pool. Third pool, you remember it? You've had so many impersonators on this, what you've tried to explain, but said, don't even try this. Do you remember it? How many remembers that vision? Why? It's all over the tape and everywhere. That's been about seven, six, seven years ago, been seven years ago, said, don't try to explain that. This is the third pool. I'll meet you in there. What did he just do? He just tied those two things together. Because the sword in his hand, he said, this is your third pull. But seven years ago, he said, I'll meet you in there. This will be your third pull. And now he said, this is the third pull. I'll meet you in there. <laughs> Praise God. Explain all that, Brother Chad. I can't. I can't. Not because I'm not allowed to, because I can't. I really can't explain it. But something's thundering in my heart. Amen, amen, amen. And I can't explain it in details. I can't explain it mechanical. I can't show you on a graph. I can't list it on a PowerPoint. I can't get you into a place where you now realize I'm in the little room and what am I here? I can't do it for you. Nobody can do it for you. It's something that you and God alone go through. You can't explain it. You hear it. You receive it. You believe it. I don't even know how to, I don't even know what terms to use. He says in, in the seventh seal, he said, I'd better stop right there. I just feel checked not to say no more about it. You know my experience the first time I read the seventh seal, that was like the most anticlimactic statement in the whole world for me. I was looking for him to do what he did the first six seals. And when he didn't do it in the seventh seal, I was disappointed. And I didn't see what I was looking at. I was looking right at it. I was reading it, but I wasn't seeing it. I just feel check not to say no more about it. So just remember the seventh seal, the reason it was not open, the reason it did not reveal it, no one should know about it. So are we supposed to know about the seventh seal or not? The reason it did not reveal it, no one should know about it. Let's go back to the vision. Whenever you catch a statement like that, don't get off in the weeds. Go back to the vision. Each one lit into a little room where the pillar of fire was by themselves. They came in afflicted. They came out whole without being able to comprehend what happened to them, that just something changed. Right? But Brother Branham says, he says, the reason I did not reveal, it did not reveal it, no one should know about it. No one should know about it. But when I ask you, the person who came out of the little room, did they know about it? So no one should know about it doesn't mean nobody will ever catch the revelation. But he's not allowed to explain this one like he did the other two. No one should know about it. And I want you to know before I even know one word about that, that vision come years ago. You remember that. And here it is, just as this other has slides right straight into the word exactly where it was. And God knows my heart. I never one time thought of such a thing as that. And here it was. It's later than we think. Oh my, just so as it's from God, for it fits exactly in the promises of God from the end, from the end of the message. You notice, now, for the end of time message, this seal. So this seventh seal is the end of time message. Have you heard the end of time message? That's what he said this seal was. He's revealed all the six seals, but he don't say nothing about the seven. And the end time seal, when it starts, will be absolutely a total secret according to the Bible. I'd just like to make this statement. For everybody who would say that the seventh seal is not open, I would say, how would you know? How can you say that? 
The seventh seal not open. He says when the end time seal, when it starts, it'll be absolutely a total secret according to the Bible. When it starts, it'll be absolute a total secret. Well, the seventh seal's not open. How do you know? It's an absolute total secret. (laughs) According to the Bible. When it starts, it'll be an absolute total secret. Oh, praise be to God. be a total secret according to the Bible. And before knowing that, remember Revelation 10, 1 to 7. At the end of the seventh angel's message, all the mysteries of God should be known were at the end time, the opening of the seventh seal. He just told you we're at the opening of the seventh seal. This is the end time message, this seal. It's the end of time seal. He calls it all these things. But he says we're here. We're at the end time, the opening of the seventh seal. But I don't think it opened. Oh my goodness, how would you know? Unless you went through the little room. We're at the end time, the opening of the seventh seal. Now how did I know the other day, last Sunday, a week ago today, when I was preaching on be humble, be humble. Remember, God deals in little things. I didn't realize what it really was talking about, and now I see it. What Brother Bram said, Brother Bram just told you we're at the end of time, the opening of the seventh seal. How did I know a week ago when I said don't look for big things? Remember, when we got to the end of uh, um, God hiding himself in simplicity, he says, I hope that the message accomplished that the purpose it was spoke for to not have you look for big flowers things and now he comes and tells you when this end time seal when the seventh seal is open it'll be absolute a total secret according to the Bible but he says now we're here at the end time the opening of the seventh seal how did I know a week ago Sunday when I said be humble be humble don't look for big things I didn't even really know what I was talking about and now I see it. It's in such a humble way. You think that something like that would be revealed to the Vatican, or it comes just like John the Baptist. It comes like the birth of our Lord in the stable. Glory to God, so help me. The hour is at hand. We're here. Amen. Glory. Amen. Amen. What is it? It's a secret. But we're here. We're at the end of time, the opening of the seventh seal. We're here. Don't look for something big. Don't look for something big. It comes like John the Baptist, which is Brother Branham's ministry. He come like John the Baptist. So it comes like John the Baptist. We've had the forerunner. And it comes like our Lord in a stable. The forerunning and the manifestation. Don't look for something big. Look for something little. Simplicity, where it's hidden. He said, now I see it, it's in such a humble way, you'd think that something like that would be revealed in the Vatican, but it comes like John the Baptist. Comes like the birth of our Lord in a stable. Glory to God, so help me, the hours at hand were here. Now, do you see it? I love that he said that right then. It does my heart good. The first several times I read that, I was like, no. (laughs) But now when I'm reading, I'm like, yes, God. I'm beginning to see it. Help me see it more. God, I'm starting to realize what you've done in our day. Help me to realize it more. Now do you see it? The truth of God's vision, the seven angels bringing me from the west. They were coming from the west, coming back east, bringing here for this message tonight. Catch that. The whole, the seven angels caught up in the constellation, bringing them back. They were bringing him back for the seventh seal message. But each angel went to him Monday night, Tuesday night, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, to reveal to him that seal that he had need of that day. I thought they would have brought him back for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but he says, no, they brought me back for this seal tonight. They brought me back for the seventh seal. What's that? Just hold it in your mind. They brought me back here for this message tonight 
Now the voice of that great thunder and the mission that was brought here has been revealed and proven that it was of God. Just think now, I knew not those seals and they've been revealed this week. Did anybody think of that, of those seven angels being this, being the message that has come forth, them angels bring me back here for that? And questions and answers from 1964, he gets a question that says, have the seven thunders which equals the seven mysteries already been revealed? Were they revealed in the seven seals but they are, are yet not known to us as the thunders yet? It's a good question. And the answer is no, they were revealed in the seven seals. That's what the thunders was about. The seven thunders that had uttered their voices and no one could make out what it was. John knew what it was, but he was forbidden to write it. But he said, but the seventh angel in the days of his sounding, the seven mysteries of the seven thunders would be revealed. And the seventh angel is a messenger of the seventh church age. So he's telling you during the message of the seventh church age, the seven thunders would sound out. What was that? It was the seven seals. That's what the seven seals was all about. It was the sounding of those seven thunders. Again, in the seventh seal, he says seven, God's perfect number, seven. Just right down the row, seven thunders uttered straight together like they're spelling out something. All that time, John started to write. He said, don't write it. Jesus never spoke of it. John couldn't write it. Angels know nothing about it. Okay, let's read this again. I don't want you to get lost in the details. Hang with me. Now we're talking about the seven thunders. Brother Branham said they were revealed in the seven seals. That's what the thunders was about. He said, and he says, uh, he says, listen, the seven thunders that uttered her voices and no one could make it out. That's what the thunders was about, uh, was revealed in those seals. But the seventh angel in the days of his sounding, the seven mysteries of the seven thunders would be revealed. So in the days of the sounding of the seventh church age messenger, those seven thunders would be revealed. That's what the seals was all about. That's what preaching the seals was all about. Now listen to what he says here. God's perfect number seven. He knocks on the pulpit six times, just right down the row, seven thunders uttering straight together like they're spelling out something. What does he say by spelling out something? Like they're trying to get you to realize something, like they're trying to explain something. Notice at that time, John started to write and said, don't write it. So when we see the seven thunders uttered, John was told to write everything that he saw and everything that he heard. So he picks up his pen to write, amen, and he says, don't write what the seven thunders uttered. So said, don't write it. Then he says, Jesus never spoke of it. John couldn't write it. Angels know nothing about it. What is it? It's the thing that Jesus said even the angels of heaven didn't know nothing about it. See, he didn't know it himself. said only God would know it. Amen. What is the mystery that Jesus said angels don't know about and he himself don't know about, but only God knows. Let's go to Mark 13. He said, this is the mystery that the seven thunders were spelling out. They're spelling seven in a row, like they're spelling out something. He says, at that time, John started to write it, but he was forbidden to write it. Jesus never spoke of it. Remember Brother Benham through the seals, in the sixth seal, he took you back to Matthew chapter 24 when they asked, when will be the end of the world and the sign of your coming and all these things take place? And he starts to answer him and Jesus in Matthew 24 takes him through six seals, but he doesn't say anything about the seventh. That's what he's speaking of here. Jesus never spoke of it. John couldn't write it. Angels know nothing about it. What is it? It's the thing that Jesus said even the angels of heaven didn't know nothing about. He didn't know it himself, and only God would know it. Mark 13 and 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. That's Israel. When her branches is yet tender and put it forth leaves, and knoweth that summer is near, when she's early in her nationhood. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. 
It's the mystery of his coming. In the seventh seal, he says, now, there was some reason that God let those seven voices be thundered because it must come. We find that Christ, the lamb, took the book in his hand and he opened the seventh seal. But you see, it's a hidden mystery. No one knows it. But it, it's right along with what he said, no one would know his coming. They also would not know about the seven thunder mystery. So you see, it's connected together. What's connected together? The seventh seal, his, the mystery of his coming, and the seven thunder mystery are all connected together. That's the mystery that those seven thunders was spelling out. There was something behind that was laying under those seven thunders. There was a mystery being revealed in the preaching of the seven thunders. And that mystery was the same thing John was told not to write, that Jesus didn't speak of, that angels knew nothing about, that the son didn't know, but only the father himself knew. Let's go to Revelation chapter eight. I think I can just wrap up in just a couple minutes. Revelations 8.1, and when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now let's go over to Revelation 10. One, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. He had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared to his servants the prophets. Brother Branham said Revelations 8.1 and Revelations 10 are the same thing. And it's also the mystery of his coming. In the seventh seal, he says, when will it be, Brother Branham? I cannot tell you, I do not know, but one of these days, if we ever meet again on this earth, we're going to meet yonder at the judgment seat of Christ, and you'll find out that in the room, the revelation coming from God, just like all the rest of them has. What's he talking about? The revelation that came to him in the room on the seventh seal was just like the first six. That revelation came to me in the room just like the other ones has. One of the mysteries of that seal, one of the mysteries of that seal, the reason it wasn't revealed, it was seven thunders that uttered their voices. And there it is perfectly because nothing knows anything about it, wasn't even written. So we're at the end time, we are here. What did he just get done? He's finishing preaching the seven thunders and he's telling you what is that mystery? It's the seven thunders and he's just finished preaching the seven thunders and he's saying we're here and he's not allowed to tell you this is that. He's, you've got to catch it, amen? In the silence of not what's being spoken, there has to be a voice from down on the inside that says that is that, amen? That is exactly what the word said. That's exactly what he's pointing to. That's exactly what he's talking about. But if you're waiting for him to say this is that, he's not allowed to do that. There's a silence still in the seventh seal and the silence in the seventh seal is only broken inside of you when the voice thunders from down inside of you. It says that's nothing but the truth. The breaking of the seventh seal, it was broken. The sounding of those thunders, that was the first part of that revelation, amen? Those seven thunders uttered out. That was the first part of that, which was tied to Revelations 8.1, which is tied to the coming of the Lord. But it was silence, and he's not allowed to explain it. He explained the first and second. He's not allowed to explain this one. What is it? It's the word. What was the preaching of those seven thunders? The unwritten word, amen? John couldn't write it. It wasn't written. It was the white stone in Junior Jackson's a dream. Shouldn't lie to never show. Unwritten word. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. And so now when the word comes into his hand and day by day he receives it from an angel and he comes out and speaks the word, the unwritten word, he shows it in the written word. 
when he gets to the end of that, he's telling you that what is it? What is Revelation 8, 1? It's what couldn't be spoken. Jesus never spoke of it in Matthew 24. John was forbidden to write it. The angels don't know about it. Even the son don't know, only the father. It's the mystery of his coming. Don't be offended in him. Because it's not like what most people were looking for. It's not what the world was looking for. Brother Bram said we don't look for nail scars. We look for the word made manifest. What is the preaching of the seven thunders? The word made manifest. When what was sealed is unsealed under the, the, the mystery of God shall be finished in the voice of the seventh angel. What is that? Amen. It's the unsealing of the mystery. It's the word. It's the third pool. It's all connected together. He says, I'll read this last sentence again. One of the mystery of that seal, the reason it wasn't revealed it was seven thunders that uttered their voices. And there it is perfectly, because nothing knows anything about it, wasn't even written. So we're at the end time. We are here. In the breach, this is all the way back before he starts preaching the seals. He preached God's in simplicity. He preaches the breach on Revelation chapter five. And he said, this seven sealed book is revealed at the time of the seven thunders of Revelation 10. Is the seven seal book revealed? Yes. Has the thunder found, seven thunders sounded? Yes. What does that mean? Let's go to Revelation chapter five. Verse one. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the lamb, when the lamb, I saw when the lamb, opened one of the seals. And I heard the word of the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Amen. Brother Branham said in the sixth seal, so now tonight we have assembled here to hear your word. And as we have been studying in this certain portion of the scripture, that the lamb was the only one that could open the seals or to loose them. Yes. Who opened those seals? Why did he open those seals? How do you know the seals were open? Because of the seven thunders. When did you hear the seven thunders? In those consecutive nights of services. When he was given the revelation of the unwritten word, what John was not allowed to write. When he was given the revelation of the unwritten word, it tied you right back to the silence from Re Revelation chapter eight. They're the same thing. The revelation of the unwritten word is revealing what was done in that silence. What was that silence? It's his coming. And I'll just ask you a couple questions. Are you married to the lamb? Is this the invisible union? Is the wedding here? then he has to be here. You can't marry somebody who's not present. Now, is the bride pregnated with the word? Has he pregnated somebody he's not married to? Can he marry somebody when he's not present? Can he pregnate somebody without being here? See, it's, 
It's so simple, we can walk right over the top of it because we have in our mind, we're looking for the denominational picture of a giant image of Jesus coming down and we all stretch our hands out and we all begin to float up to him. But that's a denominational idea. It's not, it's not the scripture, it's not what Brother Benham told us, amen. He don't look for nail scars, we look for the word made manifest. It's the silence of the seventh seal. It was silent. But it was silent in the cave too. But Elijah heard something. See, the rapture is even not what we expected. Because Brother Branham teaches us in the rapture that there's three stages to it, and it's not even what we expected. We were looking for something and missing what we were seeing. And I wanna go back to the first scripture. When you think you know something, you know nothing as you ought. We talk about all these things and see all these things in the seventh seal, what Brother Benham said, and the seven thunders and the silence, and I still say we don't know anything as we ought to know. I still think there's so much for us to understand. There's still things I read and I don't know how it fits. There's still things I read the prophet saying, I still don't know what he means by that, amen. But one thing I know is is that this is the truth, amen. And I know this is our Lord and I know our Lord is the one who opened those seals. It wasn't a man, it was him. And he couldn't open those seals until he came forth to take the book and to loose the seals. And that was the seven thunders. I don't know the rest of the picture always. I don't know how it will manifest in coming days. I don't always know what the next step is, but I know that's nothing but the truth. Not because somebody told me, I read it and read it and I heard it and heard it, but one day it was like thunder on the inside. It's not something I heard with my ears, but something within the inside of me said, that's it, amen, that is it, that is what he's trying to tell me. And what he was saying in the revelation of my heart just began to slide together. And the quotes and the scriptures began to slide together. But as much as that has slid together, I still say when we think we know something, we know nothing as we ought. There's still more to this revelation, friends. There's still something more. Amen. When Brother Brandon said this is the first part of that, of that seal, amen, was those seven thunders, he said it unfolded in a three-part manner. Showing that even the opening of the seventh seal, amen, is not just a pinpoint prick. Seventh seal opens, closes, that's all of it, it's done. Coming of the Lord, period. He said it unfolded in a threefold manner. He said this is the first part of that seal is those seven thunders. So when we think we know something, we know nothing as we ought to. But I say, God, I want to know all that I ought to. Ah. I want to see what I'm looking at. Because what I'm looking at thrills my soul. What I'm looking at is the most exciting thing that I've ever seen in my life. But I want to see what I'm looking at. I want, to, I want the eyes to have to see. I want you to come and reveal to me. I want to see it more clearly than I've ever seen it before in my life. Show me more. Reveal me more. Open my eyes more. No matter what. God does for you, no matter what you see and what revelation comes, don't ever stop, friends. Don't ever stop moving forward. Don't ever stop seeking more. Brother Branham tells us in the Church Age book, above everything else, play for revelation. That means above everything else, more than your food, your job, more than your health and your security, pray for revelation. It means more than security. It means more than health. If you're a cripple, you need revelation more than you need healing in your body. Because with this revelation, you can die with eternal life inside of you, and that crippled body will come back new. Be more than healing, be more, more than money, more than food, we need revelation. Divine revelation from the Father. Above all, pray for revelation. Don't stop just because now God's given me a witness in my heart. I see those thunders. I see the opening. That was just the first part. But I want to see it all. This is my Lord. This isn't doctrine. This isn't teachings. This isn't neat, fun things to preach. This is my Lord. 
This is the, you look at the book of Revelation and the book of Revelation starts the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, I want to know it all. Amen. I'm not happy with chapter 10. Amen. Got that. I don't want, I want it all. Amen. Then brother Bram comes and says, this is the revelation of Christ. Amen. So I want it all. Amen. It's available friends. It's been given to us. This end time message has given us the revelation of Jesus Christ. The mystery of God is finished. Christ is the mystery of God revealed. It's been handed over to our hands. Now may God let us see what we're looking at. Let's pray for revelation. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you come. Brother John, if you make your way up. Let's just bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this wonderful, wonderful word that you've placed in our hands. But God, we can hold it, we can read it, and we can listen to it. But only you can break the silence of the seventh seal. Only you can break that silence to the individual alone in the little room when you begin to reveal yourself to them. God, I pray that you would break the seventh seal of silence for us all. For every one of your hungry children, Lord, that are raising their hand and saying, God, I want more revelation. I pray that you would keep thundering in their heart the revelation. God, without you, it's not possible. You're the only one that can bring revelation. So, Father, we ask that you would bring us abundant, life-giving revelation. God, we need you in this hour. God, you've been so good to reveal yourself, but we're hungry for more, Lord. Help us to see what we're looking at. Make it real, make it vivid, make it a revelation in our heart, Lord. May you do the work inside of us so that we can see with your eyes what we're supposed to see. May you break the silence of the seventh seal in our hearts, Lord. By a divine revelation personally to each individual. God, if there's anybody here, Lord, that is still groping around and not sure, they want you, Lord, but they don't know how to find you, Lord, I pray that you would come to them and reveal yourself to them in a greater way. Speak to them, Lord, down on the inside, deep in the heart, where the word comes to the word, Lord, and quickens that word to life. God, may you do that work, I pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Bring genuine births by the word. God, may we see you as you are in this day. We sang, Lord, at the beginning of this service, I want to see Jesus. Lord, help us not to be offended when you show yourself to us. Let us not be offended in you in the way that you've come in this hour, in the way that you're manifesting yourself in simplicity and revealing yourself in the same. Let us not be offended in you. For God, many are offended in your manifestation in this day. Many are offended because it was not what they expected. Let us not be one of those many, Lord. Help us, God. Change us. Reveal yourself to us. Speak to us, almighty God, that we might see you in a greater way. We commit ourselves to you, Lord. As you speak to us, Lord, may we grab the mantle and wrap it around our face. Because we realize, Lord, there's nothing we could have done to reveal these things to ourselves. There's not one thing we can do to produce a revelation. There's not one thing we can do to understand you. But God, if you've spoken down with inside of us, it's by your abundant grace. And in humility, Lord, we come to you to say thank you, Father. To hear the commission that you have for us, the purpose in this life. And may we go forth, Lord, and fulfill that purpose with all that's in us. May we be obedient to your calling. Oh, we love you. We ask that you would move, Lord, like only you can move, and that you would do the supernatural in our lives. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.